at uh, Syracuse University. And so I think we're in for a very lively conversation this afternoon. Zandale is going to uh, moderate our conversation for roughly the first 20 or so minutes, and then it'll be opened up to you for your, uh, for your questions. Um, so with no further ado, I just want to say thank you very much on behalf of the school for coming up here to Syracuse on our cold, uh, you know, still in March day, and uh, we really, really appreciate your coming here and, and sharing your wisdom with, uh, with, our, with our students. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Y'all can do way better than that. <laughs> and before we get started, I just want to thank Professor Shane so much for that amazing introduction that was all lies. Because the only thing cool about me is that I'm a fellow Orange Woman. I graduated from Newhouse a few years ago. So it's very, very good to be here amongst all of you. I want to thank him again, and I want to thank um, um, Melissa Cheshire, who's so awesome, a rock star, as well as Marianne Durante, and for the cupcakes and all those good things. And can we just get one more applause to let go of all the nerves that I have? And maybe have? <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's a friendship circle. We're about to have a lively Q&A session where we're going to spill tea. My students know what spilling tea means. It means sharing. And you guys also can ask some pretty amazing questions. So are you ready? Ready. Are you nervous? A little bit. Okay, cool. <laughs> we got you, don't worry. We got all your personal Oprahs up in here. So let's start from the beginning. Okay. Harvard, Massachusetts. Oh, oh that is the Population 6,502 people. Population 4,000. Oh, wow. They came up. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like growing up there? Um, I didn't really know any that much like anything different really. Um, we lived in Boston <clears throat> when until I was in about third grade and then moved out there. So it was great in terms of there's lots of land and you could run and there was no crime and it was sort of like this little Mayberry. There was like one blinking light. There were two stores. I worked at both at one point <laughs> in my life because there was nowhere else to work. Um, and but I knew I wanted to eventually live in a larger city and I wanted to go on to like New York was the was the goal from pretty early on. So you say larger city, but your next stop ultimately was Washington, D.C., where you yes. went to Howard University Law School. Yes. So why Howard? Um, well, a few things. One, my um, parents had moved to D.C. My grandparents from both sides were in D.C. And I had looked at Howard for undergrad, um, but actually, and I should watch because this is being streamed and recorded somewhere, but my father had just become a vice president at Howard my senior year of high school. And I did not really want to go to college on the same campus as my <laughs> strict father. Um, so, um, but I, I had always had an interest in Howard, but I just didn't want to be like the, um, the teacher's kid on campus. So, but that stayed with me. So when I wanted to go to law school, it seemed like a logical time to then, to then go. And I love DC, I still love DC. Now, what some of you may not know is that Howard University is a historically black college. Mm -hmm. Was that in any way part of why you wanted to go? Did that have any impact on you? It definitely did. Having grown up in Harvard, which is very small, I was the only black girl in my high school. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted a different experience. And the best thing about Howard is it, um, it has this legacy, and, they teach, and there's a lot of history there, but it's also in D.C. It has a lot of other influences and it's really on like the world stage so you get a lot of international students and a lot of people who come in and teach and speak mm -hmm. at the school which is really nice. So you finish your graduate law school and go on to a very predictable path which is you became a corporate lawyer. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah to this day I don't really know why <laughs> I chose to do that. I got to a point where I thought I wanted to go I wanted to be a lawyer and I thought well, I'll do corporate law, maybe I'll do entertainment, or maybe I won't even practice. But I think it's unrealistic to think you come out of school, you have debt. If you did um, pretty well during that time, I was on law journal stuff, and I'm then 20 something, 26, and someone offers you six figures, it's hard to say, no, thank you. Oh, yeah, we right? know that. <laughs> um, so I went into corporate law, and I did really enjoy it during the dot com years because you're working with really with small creative companies that are building, you know these interesting businesses, but then the bubble bursts and um, their business dried up and they stopped paying their bills and we stopped doing that work and then it went back to just like traditional deals. I think the last deal that I worked on was a um, hundred million dollar deal where they were selling, it was disposable razors. 
Oh, wow. And I thought to myself as I sat in the conference room for about 17 hours that I could not spend my life selling disposable razors. So while you're sitting there listening about disposable razors, what in your heart, what is your heart telling you to do? What other fields are you maybe thinking you should be getting into? At that part, you know, and that's what I knew it was a sign for me because a lot of people who are really great at corporate law just love doing the deal. It doesn't matter if it's razors or widgets or whatever, they're passionate about it. And I didn't have that passion. I couldn't get past the fact that I was, it was disposable razors. Um, and so I knew that I would never be great at that because I just didn't love the law like that. I didn't want to read about it and talk about it in my spare time. I didn't want to come to conversations like this you know, that were voluntary if they had to do with like corporate law. So I knew like this was never going to be really, I was just never going to be great at it. It was never going to be my great love. So I started to look for things that I could do with a law degree that wouldn't require such a pay cut. Mm. I looked like at business development positions and a lot of things. And it was actually a really good friend of mine from law school who said, you know, the one um, thing that I've always heard you have an interest in with magazines. And in New York, you're not going to be you know, living so well on half your salary, so you might as well just go for broke and do exactly what you want to do, and it just clicked. And so I started taking classes um, at NYU and some just classes in the evenings and saved a year's worth of mortgage payments because I had just bought an apartment. So this is my plan that like I may not be able to eat, but at least I wouldn't be homeless. So were these magazine classes that you were taking? Yeah, a lot of them like um, the business of publishing, writing for women's magazines, travel writing, classes like that. But prior to this, you'd never even thought about working at magazines or? I mean, if you look back, there were signs along the way. I had been an editor of a law journal. I had um, written for the school paper at one point. I All of the classes that I got really, like my best grades in were all writing classes. All should have been signs, but I just um, didn't uh, ignore them. So <laughs> this is <laughs> where, this is where Kia's story gets a little gangsta. Because <laughs> Kia does something that some of you may be able to identify with. You left it all behind and became an intern. I did. So after I had saved uh, my year's worth of mortgage payments, I flooded the industry with my resume and no one would hire me. Um, people thought that I wouldn't go from having an assistant to not being an assistant. And so um, it was getting closer and closer to the point where I was like, I was just going to quit regardless. And there was a travel magazine that had just started called Travel Savvy. And I sent them my resume like three different ways. And they said, finally, like they got it from like, I think a messenger was like the final, like the straw that broke them. They're like, just come in already, like stop harassing us. You paid a messenger to physically take. Yes, because I was, I was like, I was quitting on a Friday and this was like Tuesday and I still didn't have a job. And I thought like, you know, I have to do something. Um, and uh, and the owner of the company called me and said, we have no idea why you want to work here, but come in already. Mm-hmm. And um, I went in and I met with him, and what they had was a lifestyle internship. And I said, I'll take it. They're going, you're really? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, and, I, and it was the best move that I ever made. So, um, so I just have to say, at this point, you're not the average intern age, clearly. <laughs> so was there no part of your ego that was bristling at? You know, there really wasn't. I was so excited to be working for a magazine that that trumped any, like, any other feeling I had. Mm-hmm. Like there, I was so happy. I was just, I, because when I was practicing corporate law, like I knew, it was literally like, I felt like I was wilting inside. I just knew that it wasn't mm-hmm. for me. And I would say to people like, you know, I would do a little work, then I'd shop a little online, then I'd do a little work because I was so bored and I was looking for distractions. When I got into publishing, it was like 24 seven. It was just everything about, working either for my job or taking classes to continue learning. This is so beautiful because this is why it keeps getting gangsta for Kia. Because in, <laughs> like two, we up, <laughs> in two years, you went from an intern to what? To editor-in-chief. Wow. Travel wow. Clap it up. So, yeah. um, and really, because people have asked me, like, how did that happen? And I really think it starts with just being so passionate about what I was doing. And I volunteered for every assignment there. Like, you know, who can go to wherever it was? Like, you know, it wasn't always the Caribbean. Sometimes it was not places that were not that sexy. I was like, oh, God, I'll write about it. I'll do whatever, you know. Um, and it, it just gave me a lot of experience. And then I do think that the, that the legal training helped in terms of work ethic and not being intimidated to jump into something new um, definitely helped. 
But what I'm curious about is, that's why illegal training, what being EIC meant is you were also now in a serious leadership role, yeah. overseeing staff. Was that something you felt prepared for or something you had to cultivate along the way? Um, that is something that I felt I was prepared for at the time, but looking back, mm -hmm. um, definitely, you know, we do things differently now, having been in that role at three different publications. Mm -hmm. But management is something, you know, it's a different skill and they don't really teach you that at school. So I did start, I did, I think like, I only read nonfiction, so, or I, I try to read fiction, but I tend to read nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would read, I read a bunch of management books, and they weren't mm -hmm. necessarily like hardcore books. Like there's one that's called like, How to Be the Boss Without Being the Bee. <laughs> and so, um, and I read some, you know, interesting books like that because it was also a change going from a legal world where like people did not, uh, you weren't working with creative types. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between managing lawyers and managing artists, which is basically what with writers and photographers you are. So that is something that I have to learn along the way. I can imagine. Now, you clearly did a good job because after that you were hired at Niche Media. Yes. And so what was the title there? I went in to Niche Media as managing editor. Um, it was for a job to be managing editor of two of their publications in New York, so I assumed it was Gotham and Hamptons, mm -hmm. and then I got into the interview and it was LA Confidential and Aspen Peak. And I was like, hmm but doing it from New York. Oh, nice. um, so I was there and um, did that for about a year and a half, two years, and then was promoted to their flagship Gotham in New York and was editor-in-chief of Gotham. Clap it up. Okay. <laughs> Career editor-in-chief. So what was, even though it's still within the same publishing house, what was the difference so far as management or just experience or content? Um, the difference was, well, besides actually being in the city that I was writing about, which was a lot more enjoyable because so many of my relationships when I was at LA Confidential were really built online or on the phone, and then I would just see them when I would travel. But also Gotham was their flagship, is their flagship publication, and it's the home office. So just the um, level of stuff, the number of events and things that I was going to, that changed overnight. I remember the owner, Jason Ben, saying to me, like, get ready for your life to completely change. Wow. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I moved, like, one office over, I, you know, whatever. And it did. Because all of a sudden, like, I'm in this city at the number one, like, luxury lifestyle publication, so just there were things to go to every night. Like, you guys know yeah. how, like, in New York, like, you could go out every night. And so now it is, and I'm going out for work, but it's, like, really interesting, wonderful things and covering really interesting people. And so um, just the level of exposure and dealing with that kind of stuff definitely changed and was um, good prep for the job I'm in now. Which we'll get to. <laughs> now, I want to ask you my next question, but before that, I just want to take a pause. At, at this point in your life, are you feeling like this is surreal? I've gone from law to intern to not being an EIC at my second book in almost no time. What was in time? I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. You know, to everyone, I think on the outside it does feel like, it, it did happen very quickly, but probably not as quickly for me as it happened to people like outside who think like, oh, she did that in no time. Mm -hmm. um, the, it is, I knew there was enough time, I don't have time for it to be surreal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it was, I would say like the first month, there was a moment at Rides where I just sat in my office and I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> But there's so much that I want to do mm -hmm. that literally by 11 o'clock in the morning, if I have a day when I'm in the office for the whole day, by 11 o'clock in the morning, I look at that clock and I feel like we're running out of time today. Wow. So there isn't really, you know, and it's just because there's just a lot of things that I want to do. Um, so you can't really soak it up just yet? Yeah, no. So let me ask you, before you get to Brides, though, um, when I was researching, I saw that you ended up leaving um, the magazine, the Isn't Bleeding Gotham. Mm -hmm. to go to Bride as an executive editor. Right. Well, I went right. from there to Uptown. To Uptown. And then from Uptown, um, I did go as an executive editor, which a lot of people questioned because people wondered why would I go from being editor-in-chief of my own book to an executive editor to the number two spot right. at Bride. Right. And it's interesting because I had never thought about this until one of your earlier questions about, like, from an ego perspective, was it weird to be an intern there? Mm -hmm. Or was it weird for me to be number two at Brides, and it really wasn't. Um, and I think, again, that comes from like, my goal was to work with the smartest people I possibly could on the largest stage, mm -hmm. or the most interesting stage, and for me, it, that was Condé Nast. Mm -hmm. um, and so, 
I wasn't going to let ego or just anything get in the way of that. So this was an opportunity to be number two. I had never worked at Condé Nast and had always wanted to mm -hmm. um, and really was impressed with the people I met both on the corporate level and the editor-in-chief at the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is someone who I can, this is an environment where I can learn a lot. And you want to make sure that you're always growing. Like any editor who thinks that they know everything is just wrong. Like mm -hmm. No one, you just don't. Um, and that was really important to me. So by this point, you've basically worked at several publications that are really kind of different in their DNA. Yeah. Uptown, which is a luxury book as well, but covers mostly up um, African-American yeah. demographic, is obviously so different from Bride. All those are so different from Gotham and LA Confidential. Are you feeling a little schizophrenic in, in how you have to sort of <laughs> switch your interests, or is it just a skill set that you're applying to different topics? Um, well, I think that there is a common thread, which is um, there's a lifestyle element to all of the magazines where I've worked. And um, it's always been about the stuff that makes, it's about the extras. It's about a great meal or a great vacation or great fashion um, or great beauty tips. And so that has been a common thread and it sort of just all culminates with Brides, which is really like the ultimate women's magazine. Um, so it, it actually, a lot of the stuff that I've covered before, I am still covering, just in a different context. I like that. I like that. So this is all bringing us to that fateful day last year, September 2012, when you're announced as, drum roll please, <laughs> <laughs> Condé Nast's first ever African-American editor-in-chief and the editor-in-chief of Vice Magazine. Can you yes. walk us through that day? Like, what were you wearing? What were you eating? <laughs> Girl, you want to know all the details. Um, okay, I don't remember what I was wearing. Um, but I had had a lot of meetings that whole week. So um, I went up to the editorial director's office and I talked, I needed to talk to him about something else, actually. I think it was the cover of that because um, the editor before me had left like maybe a week or two before we were closing mm -hmm. the issue. So I, because we were in transition and I was interim, I had gone to his office to just to show him the cover and see what we were doing, and we, um, just to show him what we were doing. And we finished all that, and he said, okay, we finished? And I said, yes, and I got up to leave his office, and he said, oh, there's one other thing I want to talk to you about. And, um, and I said, okay. And he said, I'd like to offer you the job. And so, and um, he is very supportive of editors in general, and we have a really great rapport, so it was great to have it, um, just to have that moment, because I knew I'd be working with him going forward, and I also knew, like, this was the moment I was waiting for. So I got out of the office, and I thought, like, okay, keep it calm until you get downstairs, you know? <laughs> um, and, um, and then the um, president and CEO came down, and and came to our conference room and made an announcement. And as someone on my staff said, I knew it was going to be good news because there was champagne in the office and it was like three o'clock. <laughs> so, Were you at all surprised? Um, at that point, it probably was surreal. I had thought, I mean, I had actively thrown my hat in the ring. So it wasn't like I was just, you know, walking down the street and they just plucked me from the from there. So. But I, you know, you just never know in that kind of situation. And I hadn't been in the building for that long, mm -hmm. for about, just for about a year. So, you know, and people, a ton of people wanted this job, obviously, so. Mm -hmm. um, You're the girl that got it. Right. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to life after that super major announcement. Mm -hmm. And you guys, I'm sure you guys have already Googled Kia, but when I did, I'll tell you this, in about 22 seconds, I got over 10,600 results for you. And a great majority of them had sentences like breaking the color barrier, knocking down doors, advancing blacks, on and on and on. It's pretty weighty stuff. Does that ever overwhelm you? Because I know that you wanted to be editor-in-chief, but maybe you weren't trying to be Barack Obama of Condé Nast. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it will weigh on me more if I look back on this time and I'm not, as long as I look back at this time and I'm proud of the work that I've done, I'll be fine with it. But I do feel like, you know, my appointment did get a lot of press and that's great and I love the support. Like a lot of people just email me out of the blue to give me, you know, just well wishes and we're rooting for you girl and that kind of thing, which is great. But 
I also feel like I'll be a little bit more comfortable with the press when I have more of a track record to stand on. So if I can look back on this time and say, you know, we were able to do X, Y, and Z to take the brand to new levels, then I will feel proud about what I did both as an editor and as a black editor at the company. So it doesn't weigh on me now any more than what weighs on me is I want to be the best editor I possibly can be and the best editor the bride has ever had. That's what that's the thought that wakes me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now that is is also a challenge because you certainly come to brides at a very interesting time in the history of the book. And really, to be honest, in the history of any book, because digital is really changing the game. And I can imagine that it's impacting your demographic more than most because brides are young, which then means that brides are digital. Yes. So what's been your, your strategy for addressing that? That has been a huge challenge for us, as it is for most print publications. Print will continue to be the cornerstone of our brand. Um, but we are looking at different ways to expand our, our reach in the digital space, whether it's with our website or also um, through social media. This is a community that is so enthusiastic and no one wants to talk about a person's wedding more than <laughs> or as much as they do, except for other brides. So the community is really tight because every bride gets to a point where their best friends are like, okay, we don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> and having this place to go online has um, we find it's been a great forum for our audience. And so we just keep working on different ways to really shore up that community. Like we're, we're streaming a wedding live on Facebook mm -hmm. that um, our whole Facebook community voted for the couple who would win the wedding. So we, we narrowed it down to three couples and then everyone voted, one couple won. And then every aspect of the wedding was voted on by people on Facebook based on likes. So what dress she's wearing, um, Buddy, the cake boss is doing the cake, which cake it's going to be, what color scheme, which she had no say in any of that wow. stuff. And our, and our whole social media community got to basically plan the wedding, and then we're having it um, April 7th at the St. Regis in California. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at projects like that that we can do where it's sort of like, us, like we're all working together with our audience. Is this one of the projects that Professor Sheen has mentioned? Yes. Oh, exciting. <laughs> yes. Exciting. Yeah. Now, just so you guys know, our time is winding down, so I'm looking forward to your smart questions. So while you're thinking it through, you know, I want to ask you, with all the social media stuff going on, I know that you're still very dedicated to the book and making sure that it stands out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So you're still pretty new at EIC, but what's your vision going forward? Like, how do you look forward to distinguishing it? Because the bridal category is getting a little crowded as you go along. It is, especially online, it is very crowded because <laughs> the bloggers have, the blogging community has just become huge as well. Um, I think online, we'll continue to look at projects like the Bride's Live Wedding, different ways that we can really um, work with our community. We're actually doing that project with Randy Zuckerberg, who's Mark Zuckerberg's sister from Facebook. So um, that was a great partnership for us to do this. Like the first, It's the first time we're ever doing it. So we'll continue to look at projects like that. And um, But because of the history of Condé Nast especially, People really come to brides for, like we talk about it, it's the bride who puts style first because it's such, it's a company that's so, its identity is so closely tied to fashion. So um, we'll continue to continue to cover, book, to cover dresses in the magazine, but also online. What I think our site can really do is pull together curated, beautiful images for our audience. Like we, right now, um, don't have, the, or that's been our focus, and that's been the feedback from our audience is that they may do their tools and their budgets other places, but they come to us because they want to see all of our top picks for dresses before they buy their dress, or they want to see our top picks for centerpieces before they talk to their floors. So um, if I was to say like the five things that we want to focus on in digital, giving them that imagery is definitely one of the top five. Well, you know, that falls right into line with Condé Nast because all those books are so aspirational and you sort of go to them to dream, so you're providing right. the same service. Right. So how does executing this work on a day-to-day -day basis, can you run us through your day? Um, you gave us a little glimpse earlier, but... Um, you know, it sounds like it sounds so cliche, and you guys probably hear this all the time, like, no two days are the same. <laughs> um, I can say that I usually start with a staff meeting or a meeting with my deputies, like um, just about whatever's going on, um, or my assistant who is like 
the glue holding my entire life together right now. Um, and then it's meetings. It is back-to-back -back meetings. There are days when, like, I literally, like, Catherine will schedule a fake meeting just to give me, like, 20 minutes to, like, look at emails sometimes, oh. just to block out the time on the calendar. But it's usually back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings. What's interesting is you get to this position, and then I'm not editing as much as I used to, and I'm not writing as much as I used to either, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, the job has definitely changed. And it's much more being a steward of a brand. It's not just, I mean, I spend less than 50% of my time probably on print now. And when I got into it, you know, that was all I was doing. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of your time is spent in the office versus out of the office? Um, right now, I'm probably spending about, you mean in terms of travel or just like meetings outside of the office? In terms of um, travel and meetings outside of the office. I'm probably spending about 40% of my time out of the office, 30 to 40 percent of my time. Does it make it hard for the staff to feel connected to you or for you to feel connected to the staff when you're out of office so much? They're probably fine. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is hard for me. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be away for extended periods of time, but I've always been that way. Like I'm someone who takes long weekends over like a full week vacation. Mm -hmm. I start to just, I just like to I get a little like, anxious mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the office for extended periods of time. So that has been hard. That's definitely the transition from being executive editor or being um, a senior editor or features editor or anything versus being an editor-in-chief is knowing that like you, if you sit at your desk all day, you're really not doing your job right. well. So you have to do, you have to go to lunches and meet people and um, do a lot of business, other business meetings and that mm -hmm. kind of thing or press and that kind of stuff. How much, how much of, because uh, you said business, how much of sort of being on top of the finances of the book is part of your job or is part of the publishers? Um, well, the publisher is definitely on top of all the finances, especially that have to do with the ads. Mm -hmm. But every editor should be on top of the finances for her book. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's a mistake not to know what's going on with your money because if you want to do a project and, you know, you don't want someone to say to you, well, you don't have enough money to do that. And actually not know, just, you know, you don't want to have to take their word for it. If you can look at their finances, you can move things around or think or plan accordingly. So mm -hmm. I think just like you would never let somebody manage your money at home and not have any idea about your finances, it's mm -hmm. the same thing. Like you should know where the money's going. I love that. Like I'll have meetings and I'll say, well, how much is that story going to cost? And someone will say, not too much. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like. Five dollars? No. <laughs> so anything more than that? Like I need an executive here. I love that. <laughs> okay, so we're winding down. I want to give a public service announcement. Kia is on Twitter. It's at Kia Minor. And the hashtag for this event is hashtag MagSpeaksSU. If you guys want to send shout outs and questions via there. We're winding down, but I want to ask one last question before my last question. And I think I'm asking this for some of the guys and the girls in the audience. It's a total fluff question, but the devil wears Prada. <laughs> How much of that is um, real now that you've been EIC for such a while? It's all um, exaggerated. What I can say is, I mean, what am I going to say? Right? No, um, <laughs> what I can say is that, yes, the, this is the one company where I've never worked with people as fashionable as this from like in any position, everybody, whether they're an accountant for the company, in tech, a junior assistant, a senior editor, like the fashion game in this building wow. is incredible. So <laughs> that part is definitely true. Um, what what is not, or I think what was surprising for me is actually the camaraderie. Um, I think that there is this feeling of if you're working in the building, there's a reason why you're there. It mm -hmm. means that you're talented and passionate about what you do and therefore you're sort of like in the in the family mm -hmm. in the inner circle so it's um that part is, was that was left out of the movie ah, yeah. okay. <laughs> someday we'll all discover that right guys right. but everyone really is in stilettos all day which to me like some days <laughs> i'm like really <laughs> yeah, in the snow mm -hmm. yeah. car service helps yeah. though, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. yeah. okay so my last question for real this time so, you know, you're editor-in-chief, but you're also a friend, you're a daughter, you're someone's girlfriend, mm -hmm. you're, you're amazing. Like, how do you balance all these different aspects of life? And I, I think it's something I like to ask because 
I think students on this level, when you're looking to break into the career, don't realize how consuming the magazine yeah. industry can be. And before you know it, if you don't balance correctly, your whole life is sort of stuffed up in work and there isn't much else outside of it. So is that something that you're you know, cognizant of and try to balance? Um, I am definitely conscious of it. Um, probably a little late in the game. I was really consumed, I think because it was a second career for me. When I got into publishing, I was all in. It was really my focus um, and continues to be my focus. And so I probably could have done a little bit more, could have done a better job of balancing. So I would say to you guys, like balance, have fun, try new things. I think if you go like to be a lawyer in your 20s and just like on that track, I never really, you know, dabbled in this or waited tables or like tried to be an artist or whatever, you know, I mean, I can't paint, but I'm saying like, you know, you, I feel like there is time to really go out there and experiment and try new things and find really what you love because what you're doing now may not be what you love at 30 but it's better to find it out at at 20 at 25 you know the mm -hmm. earlier the better so i feel like 20s are experimental years try like five different careers <laughs> <laughs> don't tell your parents i said that <laughs> like, I'm forgetting this kind of yeah. <laughs> well thank you so much for sharing and being so open and honest can we please applaud her I'm going to open it to the Q&A session, and we're going to start with a lovely girl in the great up boots. <laughs> Guys, could you just please say your name and what year you are? Um, um, my name is Teresa Sabda. I'm a sophomore. And um, my magazine class, last semester, we had to do a magazine that we would like an 18 page paper on. And I picked Bright, and I really loved everyone I spoke to there, so I know that you're um, everyone pretty much said one thing that I think, I guess, like, people in the crowd would want to know. Um, the stigma against, like, a bridal magazine wanting fashion and beauty and that sort of stuff, like, how do you deal with that mm -hmm. in work? Because the, it, there is a stigma against bridal magazines, like, you'd be speaking to Francine Proby and you're like, hey, come to brides, like we have women who read our magazine mm -hmm. that want fashion tips and they're just kind of like, no, we would rather go to like glamour or lure where right. it is beauty based rather than bridal. It's a challenge and it's definitely a challenge too in terms of um, just from a personnel standpoint. A lot of people said that to me, are you sure you want to go into bridal? You know, and they were surprised about that. And, I think that we're changing that. Part of our redesign last year was definitely with that in mind, which was to make it more modern and fashion forward because, you know, it really is the ultimate women's magazine. Like, these women are shopping on a deadline. For beauty, it's a no-brainer, right? Because the products that people use during this phase of their life, they're going to go on and use forever because this is the moment where everyone is focused on looking their best and they will try new products. Like, if you didn't splurge on lipstick or mascara before, you're gonna splurge probably on your wedding. So it's a real opportunity for um, the beauty advertisers. And they're starting to see that, I think really a great publisher who's making them see that. But it is a challenge also with, with the fashion companies to just think of it as being forward. And I think it's because traditionally, the bridal magazines weren't at the forefront of fashion. That's coming from, you know, from other publications, but we're changing that. <laughs> yeah. Are you, as a follow up to a question, are you finding that a lot of brands are sort of now staking into fashion? For example, Monique Lillier, who we all know is a bridal mm -hmm. brand, is now sort of has a ready to wear line. Is that making it any easier for the book? Um, I mean, I don't know that we have as much of a challenge as maybe some other books do. And I can again say, because of the Condé Nast family, um, but there definitely is a challenge in terms of like if there's one, you know, if some top end designer has to, has one sample that's an ostrich clutch that we're all trying to get our hands on, it is going to go to a book, not, you know, usually that is more fashion forward because they want their products to be in there or instead of bridal sometimes because bridal is seen as more traditional. Um, but 
we don't encounter it as much as other magazines do, and I think that we're definitely changing that, which is sort of why we wanted to revamp the magazine, because the magazine's 78 years old, mm -hmm. you know, so to, um, you gotta keep things fresh every now and then, you shake things up a little bit. <laughs> Love it. Next question. Um, my name's Malia, I'm a senior magazine here. Um, I've been reading about the stats about how uh, women receive fewer nominations for Abbey Awards, and uh, women typically don't get paid as much for their major bylines. Um, so there was that kind of gender gap. And I'm wondering if you think Rise is a magazine for women by women, or are you um, actively trying to uh, promote women as a way of women writing? Um, well, we have, I think, of my edit team of 35. 32 are women. Um, I'd like to take credit for it, but I think a lot of it has to do with subject matter. <laughs> and um, But we're, I also, Conde Nast is a company that's filled with a lot of strong female editors. So it's, I mean, from Anna Winter and Dan, there are so many people. We have so many great female editors. I don't necessarily see that at my publication, but... Um, I'm not surprised, or I wasn't surprised when I heard those stats because I do hear a lot of women talk about it, whether it's like just women getting together as writers and stuff. We have a set rate that we give all of our writers um, and stick to it. But I am in a situation where I am surrounded by talented women and um, it's a girl fest. <laughs> For the three guys, sometimes I'm like, oh, you guys are so outnumbered. <laughs> you know? Um, and it's probably hard uh, hard on them, but it's great for us. It's actually great for because a lot of people have young families too. So I think it's just a really nice place to work because there's so many people who are going through the same thing. Are those three guys in a feature set of department or they're more technical? No, one is our um, researcher. One is in photo and um, one is in production. So he does like all of our color correction and correction stuff, yeah. They all are very even keeled, which I'm sure um, one would need to be. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you have like, if you're a guy and you have five sisters, it would be the same thing. Just by, by ten. <laughs> and speaking of guys. Hey! <laughs> uh, my name's Tom Charles. I'm a junior magazine editor. Um, can you talk a little bit about Facebook? I was wondering, though, what Ride stance is with and how they use Pinterest, especially mm -hmm. since it's like the obvious women demographic. Um, especially because I've taken some social media classes at the iSchool, and they talked about how social media should often be used as an extension of the brand instead of like a promotion. Yeah. So I was wondering how, in terms of that, how brides handle their social media strategy. Um, Pinterest is huge for us. Pinterest and Instagram are like um, the things that everyone's talking about and working on now. With Pinterest, it is very much that where we use it as an extension of the brand to drive traffic back to the website. But also, like, I have my own Pinterest page on the brides.com Pinterest page, like my own board. So, um, and it's just a way to connect with the audience to show them, like, what my aesthetic is and stuff that I like. It's also a great way to see what people really respond to because you get the feedback just like that. We put all that stuff up there and you see, like, some things like what gets repinned a million times. Um, but it is just a way to connect and show people who do, who may think that. Um, bridal is traditional and not fashion forward. It's just another way to enhance our brand identity as being a little bit more forward based on the images that, that we're pinning. So yeah, it's huge for us. And then Instagram, we're using as well, but more so to show people behind the scenes shots. Like we get the feedback that we get from a lot of people as they want to see like behind the scenes at the shows or on the set of like if we're shooting the cover or something like that. But you're right, Pinterest is huge. Us. Is there a huge interest in sort of also seeing what's going on in the office, what the editors are wearing, the appointments the editors are going on? We joked about that. We talked about one day we were going to do a video where like everyone was wearing a wedding dress and sitting <laughs> at their desk like they're not like it was normal. That's um, so <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly as I were doing. Um, but um, yes, we have talked about that because it's very interesting to me to hear that kind of feedback that people really just want to see what's going on at the magazine. I think the process is a little bit of a misery to people who haven't worked in publishing or haven't done an internship or something. And so we could definitely use Instagram and video to do that, but Instagram's a great way to do it. Um, and Pinterest, because I mean, with Pinterest you can just 
It's amazing. I spend so much time on, <laughs> just on the weekends, of course. Hello. Okay. Next, um, go ahead and Well, definitely, because you guys just saw at that time, you can do internships. Internships are key. Um, and because so many people have done them, I very rarely hear of people getting hired at the entry level who haven't done an internship. Um, and I also feel like work with the smartest people you know and don't be afraid to take a job that is not the exact dream job. If it's going to give you great experience, just get in there. It not, may not be the magazine that you're passionate about, but just if it presents a real opportunity for you to learn, um, I would say take it. And I would also say look at the smaller shops. I mean, I would not have gone from intern to editor-in-chief at a larger magazine. The Travel Savvy was a startup. The staff was small. The staff was young. Um, there weren't as many rules in place, and so I was able to move up, which really set me up for my next couple of positions. So I say just work with the smartest people you can and um, be enthusiastic also. And that is so strange because we talk about this, like the millennials have sort of gotten this bad rap as a generation that sort of feels, um, often feels entitled. And it's strange because I keep meeting people who are so not like that. So I, my theory is that there are like five that are like <laughs> ruining it for everybody in media. Um, but I think because of that enthusiasm really goes a long way because dinosaurs like me and other Gen Xers um, are so, so excited when we see that you guys are excited. We're excited to work with you. So I think that that helps to, keep, uh, to set yourself apart. Um, and use social media responsibly. I think if you're going into <laughs> any sort of job right now, like everybody wants someone who's mastered digital, it's key. And for you guys, it's second nature. For us, it was a skill set that we had to learn like late in the game. So just really understanding digital and being able to bring that to the table um, will make you an asset to a team. But then also use it responsibly because we do want people who are out there connecting um, with <laughs> You know whoever their community is and their network but we don't want to see like you guys like texting drunk pictures of each other and that kind of stuff or having handles that are at sexy 69 <laughs> <laughs> your name is fine okay <laughs> moving on we'll get to you Luke. i'm tay lynn i'm a freshman magazine major um, my question is what do you expect the most out of your interns oh, great question whoa <laughs> um enthusiasm i really do think like Show up on time, be enthusiastic, ask questions, um, and try to, you know, no one's expecting you guys to know everything, but it's great that if you have a question, have a suggested, like, solution in the back of your mind, too. So when you think of a question, think about, okay, like, if I was, you know, if I couldn't go ask someone, how would I answer this? Because a lot of times, like, I love when somebody, like, can figure out what a solution is to a problem. And it's usually something that, it just shows initiative. Even if it's not what I go with, I just appreciate that they presented the problem and also presented a solution. So um, I think, yeah, that and enthusiasm would carry the day. And I also feel like, you know, internships are for trying things and making mistakes. You're allowed to make mistakes at this time. So take your shot, you know, don't be a wallflower. And um, and use that experience because it's not just to get it on your resume. Like really use that experience and also connect with people who are there because you never know that um, junior editor now is an editor in chief five ten years from now. So you don't want to just like the senior people to remember you. Make sure that everybody that you connect with everybody because you never know where people are going. 
Well, it's interesting you say that because um, I read you talk about, I read an article that you were talking about mentors and how important they've been in your career. Is this the stage that you suggest they start looking for mentors they can really connect with and grow with? I think everyone at any stage in their life can use a mentor. I really do. You can be my age, you can be older. There's always someone who has either more or different experience from you that you can benefit from. But I do think with mentors, um, it's great if it happens organically and it's someone who you really connect with because you want it to be a meaningful relationship. And so I do think that it can happen, whether it's a professor here or someone who you meet um, on your internship, that's a great way to develop that relationship, to really connect with that person. Hi, um, I'm Lauren, I'm a senior magazine major. And I was wondering, earlier you talked about how the online community is starting to get crowded with other bloggers and wedding options. And the bridal magazine industry is a little bit interesting that the audience graduates very quickly and moves on. You're always trying to grab the new reader. Mm -hmm. How are you guys working to encourage new brides to come and read your magazine instead of going to online and the blogs? Um, well, I wouldn't say that we're necessarily saying come to the magazine and don't read the blogs as well. I think what we want to do is create multiple entry points to bring them in. So whether they come in through the magazine or they come in through our website or really through social, because now social is a great, like, it's one of our top refers for traffic is through Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook and stuff. Um, and it's, so I, I would say that we want them to come in however they're gonna come in. And then the key is to have stuff for the person who just got engaged. Although we always talk about the majority of people get engaged over the holidays, basically from November through Valentine's Day, it's the most like 35% or something. But most people are, you know, people are getting engaged throughout the year. So we make sure to have content that speaks to the person who is just starting the planning process and pull them in that way. But um, I think it would be a mistake to think that we are going to persuade them to come to the magazine and not go to digital as well. It's just unrealistic. For, I mean, look, you guys are all like laughing. I had like a spiral binder when I was in college. <laughs> Noah? Um, I'm Noah Silver, Stephen Sr. Um, going off of that question, kind of like what you would say, um, in our class, in our fashion and beauty journalism class, we talk about um, bloggers sometimes getting um, special treatment because they're bloggers and they can get information really quickly, whereas, of course, there's a lot of time with print uh, journalism. So, what do you think of um, that whole culture of kind of putting bloggers on still rather than um, maybe maybe they're even getting better treated than the editors. I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's interesting. What in what industry specifically in fashion? fashion. Yeah. Like the front rows and Brian Boy. Yeah. Oh I, <laughs> I um I do think that yes, they have definitely, you know, Five years ago, you wouldn't have seen any of them, any bloggers in the front row. So we are definitely seeing them. I think the bridal space is unique in terms of, you know, with a 78-year-old brand, um, we're still, and it's a Conde Nast title, um, we're, not, we're not really seeing that as, um, like we're getting the products probably faster than ever. Because you know the thing is, a lot of the decisions are still being made by people who are Gen Xers, and they want to see their products in print. And even if they want to see it online as well, but um, there is still some sort of sort of cachet with print. And especially if you're in fashion, if you're a, a dress designer, there's something about seeing a big, gorgeous white dress and paper, that luscious image that is different from seeing it on your mobile device. Um, so in our industry, probably more than others, print is still very important. That's interesting for the bloggers. Mm -hmm. They're living the life. Not right, yeah. <laughs> Christina? Hi. And I'm sorry, so sorry, Christina. Just we're going to wrap up pretty soon. We're getting to the last three or four questions, so get them. I'm Christina Ferraro. I'm here in Senior Magazine Journalism. Um, we've moved around kind of a bit, and moving around is kind of part of the emphasis, kind of so, like you said. Um, I was just wondering if you see yourself playing editing to subscribe. Yeah. 
It's going to take me a really long time to feel like I've done all the here. Um, now, I say that to someone that's uh, kind of nasty is a lot like the Supreme Court. You don't leave. You just stay until you retire. Um, so I have no intention of, you know, of going on. And as one of my friends said to me, he's like, you wanted to work in that building your whole life. And I was like, yeah. So um, I have moved around, but this is an amazing opportunity. And I can't stress enough how it really is the ultimate women's magazine. Like there are very few other magazines where you get to work on beauty and fashion and entertaining because our readers are throwing the biggest party of their life, wearing the most expensive dress that most people will ever wear. Um, it's a really, it's an amazing time from that perspective. And then it's also such an emotional time. It would be really hard to talk this. Mm. Yeah. If you have to pick, um, I, I, I would say Jack of all trades because content is king. And so whatever form it's in, that is still going to carry the day, whether it's mag you know, whether it's print or whether it's an online magazine and digital or whatever, it's still going to be about content. As we develop more mediums to connect with people, we need content for all of that. Like I talked about that, it's like feeding the beast. You got to put it out there. Like it's got to be new all the time. So I would say um, be a jack of all trades for now. Figure out what you really love. But in the meantime, you have to master digital. I would say to anyone right now, you have to. Master, you will be such an asset if you um, can really figure out digital and video. Become a one-woman shop. I talk about that all the time. Like if you can produce your own videos inexpensively, it's going to help you tremendously because we're all looking at video content and how to get more of it, how to do it in a cost-effective way. Um, it's all about yeah, digital and video. Um, but that said, these are all very sort of like quick, almost disposable ways of producing stories. So where does that leave those students who may want to do more long-form writing, more features? How do you develop that in right. tandem with this? I think, you know, print is always going to be the cornerstone of my brand and of a lot of brands and certainly of my company. And so I think that there's always going to be a place where I feel like, the, you know, people talk about print dying and I feel like it's a little bit like how they felt like, you know, television was going to be the end of radio. There's always going to be a place for that. And there's a, even long form, even if it's not, for every outlet, it may not always be in print. Um, but there is places that it's like to do it for digital. The New Yorker, um, one of our sister publications, you know, those articles are 10,000 words and stuff. They have the most digital downloads on their mobile devices of any of our sister publications. So I think people are reading 10,000 word articles on a three inch screen. And so I think that there's always going to be places with, you know, for, there's always going to be room for the long form mm -hmm. future. That's a great question, and we talk about that. And I ask whenever I'm um, interviewing someone, like a new hire, I talk about that too, where they get their inspiration from. Part of that, that goes into always going out and not spending every day behind my desk. Because you have to get out there and talk to wedding planners, event planners, bloggers, um, the brides. Like, there's so many... As someone was saying, like, we have no shortage of ideas. We actually run out of pages before. So we're very fortunate because it's just an industry where people are so creative. And it's an event that overall it hasn't changed that much. Like, that's the constant. And people are just constantly trying to find new ways to reinvent it. 
and it's an industry of really creative people. And so the fashion changes, like one of my friends was saying, like, it's white dresses all the time. I'm like, no, first of all, there are like seven shades of white that we're working with just for this season, and there are different <laughs> styles and that kind of thing. But it is an area where, I mean, it's a $146 billion industry. There's a lot of people weighing in on trends and stuff. And, um, but you gotta be out there. You have to talk to everyone and really immerse yourself in the culture of your industry to find the new ideas. Because I like you won't find them sitting behind your desk. Um, well, we don't know. I don't. I don't think anyone knows how exactly it's going to play out right now. I can tell you from my perspective. I mean, she is a huge asset for the company. Like, I the, all the rumors about um, her going on to be an ambassador. I was like, I was like, it's not when I just got here because she is um, an incredible editor. And I think sometimes when you know you see the persona and you see her press, and what people forget, and having sat down with her. Is like she is a brilliant editor, and so to have her in this role where she actually can be a sounding board or can give advice or just be a consultant for who, your brand is an amazing like benefit for all of us. But I actually um, just had coffee with her last week and just talking shop and talking about where the industry is going and programs that I'd like to do and bouncing some ideas off her. You really. I think it's easy from a sitting like just reading about her in the press forget. It's easy to forget that she really is like the best lifestyle editor in the world. Like, she's incredible in terms of being just really brilliant. So um, whatever the position means, I'm just glad she's staying. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't know. I mean, it's like a week old. Yeah. So I think that we're getting ready to wrap on a very beautiful evening. Let's just take one more gorgeous question from your amazing students, and then Jim will come and send it home. Julie? Um, I know we talked about interns and what you for in the intern, but when you're hiring an external position, you'll actually interview yourself. So what is something you would look for that would make that person stand out? Um, definitely the experience, some writing experience. Um, and a sense from them that this is a career for them, not just a job. That to me is like one thing that I always look for. Like, is this just, you know, so you can live in New York City and hang out for a while? Or is this really, like, am I gonna see you grow and climb up the mastheads at various publications? And that's the person who I'm really looking for. Yeah. Nice way to end it. And now the handsome man in the gorgeous suit <laughs> is gonna come and take the mic away. <laughs> You know it's you, boo. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you so, 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 so much. That was just yeah. wonderful. Uh, let's let's have another. Have <laughs> thank you. Um, before we conclude, I do want to say thank you to those students who helped so much. This could not possibly have happened without your help. Whether it's the promotional stuff that you did or um, helping with videotapes, or making posters, or any number of things. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes. Without your help, the, the speaker of the Magazine Speaker Series, which just started this semester, you're our second um, guest here, uh, could not possibly happen. So thank you very much for, for your help, and give yourselves a hand. Thank you. And, uh, Kia, I just want to thank you on behalf of Newhouse. is a very small little token of our tremendous appreciation a little something from Syracuse University. And um, we, again, thank you very, very much. We have some cupcakes in the back, and we'd like you now to stick around, have some cupcakes, visit, and um, thank you for coming. Woo! Thank you, guys. I know. He's like, okay, somebody else has it.
like you're doing a live wedding and not just a live wedding. How, like, how is that different? I don't want everyone to be like, yeah, no, I'm sure. You know, I'm going to go up and like shake her hand. That's why we should She like gave out like our assignment, but I'm not gonna say like it's easy because what you know it's not easy. So that I guess like that really Yeah. I don't know. 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 But it's nice to meet you. It's really nice to like actually see you at the I'm 